Hi there, welcome back to the Grape Explorer. In this series of videos, we are taking a detailed walkthrough of WSCT at level two. This is part six, and this is also the final part in the series. So if you haven't checked the other videos out yet, be sure to do so. But if you are new here, welcome on the Grape Explorer. On this channel, we do wine education, product reviews, and lots of wine tastings. So let's move on into part six, and that is all about learning outcome six. Now, learning outcome six is all about understanding the key principles and processes involved in the storage and service of wine and in the pairing of food and wine as well. But what I would say about learning income six is that it actually doesn't carry that many marks when it comes to the final exam. It actually represents less than 10% of the overall score. So whilst I'm gonna go through the assessment criteria one by one, I will be asking fewer questions for this particular part today. So let's have a look at what the assessment criteria for learning outcome six is all about. You need to be able to identify the ideal conditions for storing and the methods for preserving wine. You need to be able to state the recommended service temperatures for the different types and styles of wine. You need to be able to state the correct procedures for opening and serving wine. You need to be able to identify common faults affecting the aroma and flavors of wine. And then finally, you need to identify the principal food and wine interactions. So despite this being a segment that carries relatively few marks, you're still actually covering quite a lot of detail, quite a lot of ground with this particular subject. And it is quite wide ranging in that respect. Now, assessment criteria one, as I just said, was all about identifying the ideal conditions for storing and methods for preserving wine. And as part of this assessment, you're gonna be looking at the impact of temperature, light, and how to position a bottle, as well as systems that will be helpful in preserving wine, such as the vacuum system and the blanket system. And so, as with all other videos in this series, I've got some questions here, which are gonna be typical examples you might expect to see in an exam, and to get you comfortable, of course, with that format and style of questioning. So, which of the following is true? Is it that screw cap wines need to be laid on their sides? That you need to store wines away from sunlight? That wines need to be stored at around 20 degrees centigrade? Or that the kitchen is a good place to store wine? One of these statements only can be correct, so which one is it? Now you will go through the difference between corked bottles of wine and screw top bottles of wine and the different ways that you would store them. But for screw top wines, you don't need to lay them down on their side. You'll also go through the perfect conditions for cellaring a wine, for keeping that wine in a decent condition over a long period of time. And 20 degrees is actually gonna to be too high for that. It's also not recommended that you keep wines in your kitchen. The reason for this, if you, particularly if you haven't got a wine fridge, is that the temperature fluctuations in the kitchen from when you're cooking can actually have an adverse effect on the wine. Which means the only correct answer here and the only one which is true is that you need to be able to store wines away from sunlight. That can actually cause a fault in wine where UV light impacts what's in the bottle. So moving us along onto assessment criteria two, this is where you need to be able to recommend service temperatures for the various types and styles of wine. And you'll learn that for white and rosé wines, when it comes to something like a sparkling wine, champagne, prosecco, carver, it needs to be well chilled. That's also the same for our sweet wines. And then it starts to slightly change in temperature dependent upon the style that we've got. So for light and medium bodied white and rosés, chilled is the best way to serve. And then when we move into some of our full bodied white wines, we then need to only lightly chill them. And then for red wines, again, the requirements are different. So for some of those medium and full bodied reds, we're talking about room temperature. And then for some of those light bodied reds, it can depend really on your preferred style. Some people like to lightly chill their red wines and the recommendation here in the book is that it's room temperature or lightly chill. And so thinking about that and thinking about the styles of wine and the temperatures with which they need to be served, this question is very much all about that. What is the recommended serving temperature for Carver? Is it well chilled between six and eight degrees, lightly chilled 10 to 13, chilled seven to 10 or room temperature 15 to 18 degrees. Now what your coursework book does is it doesn't just give you the definition of chilled, lightly chilled, well chilled, it will give you the temperatures that go alongside that again. Now for Carver of course, we're talking about a sparkling wine and we just did have on our previous slide there that sparkling wines were best suited to a well chilled serving temperature, which would be between six and eight degrees. 
So taking us from serving temperatures to actually serving the wine itself, we'll move on to assessment criteria number three. Now this is where you need to be able to state the correct procedures for opening and serving wines. And the processes that you will go through when you're opening a still wine, the processes for opening a sparkling wine, what decanting means as a, as a process and how it can benefit the wine, as well as a number of other things around serving of wine, particularly around your role in checking that the appearance and the nose of the wine is suitable and there aren't actually any wine faults, which we'll come on to in the next assessment criteria. But thinking about some of those processes that we have in place for opening bottles of wine, this next question is all about that. So which of the following is correct when opening a bottle of champagne? Is it that you need to keep the wire cage on? Is it that you need to shake the bottle before opening? Is it that you need to hold the bottle at an angle of 90 degrees? Or is it that you turn the bottle and not the cork? There is for sparkling wines, a very strict process in order to make sure that you're doing it safely. You need to think about this at doing it in the environment of within a restaurant, particularly in front of paying customers. I don't think shaking the bottle is gonna do any good unless somebody just won a Formula One race. Similarly, holding it at an angle of 90 degrees is gonna be great when you perhaps pour it, uh, but not perhaps when you open it. And leaving the wire cage on, of course, isn't going to allow you to open it at all. So that can only leave one answer, which is that you actually turn the bottle and not the cork. It's really important that you hold it in place and just gently turn the bottle. It prevents the cork from sort of flying out of your hand, damaging glassware, people's eyes in the process. And we'll have a true or false one here as well, because we know that the questions aren't always multiple choice. So true or false, red wines are best served in larger glasses. Is that true or is that false? Again, what you'll learn through your studies is that the greater the surface area in the glass, the more your wines have an opportunity to open up. And you've probably noticed when you've been to a restaurant that yourself that for red wines, they do tend to come in a larger glass. And that is to have that greater service area, gets those aromas opening up inside and just really enhances and improves the overall experience. So that is true. Now moving on to assessment criteria four. And one of the things we covered previously under three was around the importance of checking the appearance and the nose of the wine to prevent serving a wine that it actually has some wine faults. So Assessment criteria four is all about identifying common faults and the aromas and flavors of wine. And you'll cover cork taint, failure of closure and heat damage. Now, if you want to go into more detail about wine faults, I have very recently released a video specifically around the aromas and tastes associated with wine faults. So please be sure to check that one out. But I will ask a question today just to get you familiar with what you might expect. So your wine looks fine, but it has a musty aroma. Why might this be? Is it that the wine is old? Is it that the wine has been affected by cork taint? Is it that the character of the wine is expected to have a musty aroma? Or is it that you've stored that wine in a hot condition? There are, of course, a number of different wine faults that can occur. Some of them can occur during the winemaking process, but a lot of them do actually occur with how we store the wine once we've purchased it. And one of the things that happens when you get something like cork taint is that the cork has allowed oxygen into the bottle and that's reacted with the wine and it actually has spoiled the wine. And those musty, sort of flattened, damp, cardboardy type aromas are all as the result of cork taint. So that's the answer here. And finally, we've got assessment criteria number five, and that is all about the principal food and wine interactions. So you need to understand some of the components in food that are gonna affect your wine and then some of the components in wine that are gonna be affected by the food. Now, when it comes to the exam, it's gonna be fairly typical that you're gonna get the type of question that says, something in food is gonna do what to your wine. So to make things a little bit easier for you, I have created a, a table here, which does take you through the detail. So food that is sweet, for example, is gonna make your wine taste more bitter, more acidic, and less sweet and fruity. And that's the same for savory foods as well. When it comes to salty foods, that's gonna make your wine taste less bitter and acidic, perhaps smoother and richer. Acidic food is gonna make your wine taste less bitter and acidic, fruiter, sweeter, and richer. Highly flavored foods, of course, have the risk of overwhelming the wine itself. The wine is gonna be overwhelmed by those fruit flavors. Fatty or oily foods will make your wine taste less acidic. 
And then hot foods, but by that I mean chilly heating foods, are gonna make your wine seem more bitter, less sweet and fruity. And so as I say, the question structures here are gonna be something along the lines of, salt in food will make your wine seem what? And it's really important to go back to that table and to understand the various components in food and how they can impact your wine. So I'm not going to ask any specific questions there. I'm just going to leave that table up for you for a moment because really there are a different number of combinations with which you could be asked that. But do get prepared to have a question that is along the lines of you are eating something that has chilli heat in it. What is this going to do to your wine? So this brings our walkthrough of WSET Level 2 to an end. The exam that you will take as part of this exam is 50 questions. And over the course of six parts through this walkthrough, we have asked around 60 to 70 questions. So hopefully that's given you a really good idea about what you might expect. I hope that this series has proved beneficial for you. I hope that anyone taking this exam does really well. And please let me know your exam results down below. Let me know if you're going for the exam. It would be really lovely to hear from you. But for now, I'm going to say cheers. I'm the Grape Explorer. See you again soon. Cheers.